Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. And tonight we are continuing our study of the book of Ephesians. We are in chapter 3, verse 1. So get your Bibles ready and we'll start in just a second. Uh, let's say hello to the congregation. Uh, Sister Renee, why don't you go first? Hey there, beloved saints. Uh, missed you guys this past week, and I am looking forward to our Bible study. Mm -hmm. Amen. Did you notice that I did not introduce you as the untwisted sister? Oh, uh, yeah, you didn't. You didn't. I just, I just wanted to see if you'd notice. <laughs> <laughs> She's our untwisted sister, everybody, in case you didn't know. Uh, by the way, speaking of that, uh, uh, a lot of times Renee will make a video after the Bible study or after our church service or something, and she'll she'll decide to make a, a follow-up video on something with, that was discussed. But tonight she did a kind of a prequel for the uh, for the Bible study, and uh, uh, it's a short video, five or ten minutes long as all, but it's really profound. One of the most important um, videos you'll ever watch, I think. So if you did not see that, make sure you watch the video she just made today. Uh, Brother Ben, why don't you say hello to everybody? Hello, everyone. It's good to be here uh, with you again tonight uh, on Wednesday. Um, if you are finding that the uh, stream is a little choppy or buffering, uh, I am seeing it. It is uh, reporting some slowness on my end. Hopefully it's temporary. Uh, but worst case scenario, uh, the audio should be good. And the final recording, uh, it should be uh, just fine. So. Mm hmm. Okay, uh, I do. I do see a message from Anthony uh, saying that he sees some technical issue. So hopefully it won't be too bad or too long. Uh, but while, while I'm looking at the chat room, uh, hello to everybody. Uh, all of the all of the the, the regular um, uh, participants in the in the chat room, the the congregation. But I, I see Sister uh, Justine is is there. I'm really happy to see you there, Justine. And uh, everybody say hello to Justine. Welcome, sister. All right. Um, okay, let's get started. Uh, we're on uh, chapter 3, verse 1 in the KJV. It reads, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, let me stop there. Verse one and two, sister. Yeah. Uh, so we see, as Brother Luke often points out, that chapter divisions were not in the original letters. So uh, for this cause, I Paul, what cause? <laughs> we don't know. We got to go back to the other chapter. So we're going to look at what that cause was. Well, the whole chapter two is about how there is no more jew or gentile there is one new man in christ it doesn't profit to be a jew that we're saved by god's grace through faith in what jesus did alone and that he reconciled us both into one body and as uh brother ben pointed out last week this is a, an artistic way of saying we are a living temple like a living building and so it says, in whom all the building fitly framed to gr together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So God dwells within us as a temple, and together we are his building. And so for this cause, what cause? That cause. Because he is made a building of one new man, neither Jew nor Greek, Gentile or Jew, we're just but one new man. Doesn't matter. Uh, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. So even though he did preach to Jews, his primary ministry was geared toward Gentiles to preach them the gospel. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. So Many people wrongly make this uh, dispensation of the grace of God as if he didn't dispense grace before this time. I mean, you can see God's dispensing grace all through scripture, if you look. And they will 
uh, overly divide the word and say he's only talking to Jews here. And so everything he says is only to them. Well, it was only to them under an old covenant, but it doesn't mean we can't understand it or learn from it if we read it in a proper context. So what I'm against is wrongly saying, uh, di using dispensation in an overly simplistic way. Uh, like brother uh, Luke agrees, I believe dispensation means just to dispense, to give out. And so uh, Paul is saying that God is giving out his grace and the message of God dispensing grace toward the Gentiles was given to him to give to them. So, and it says, you've heard the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. So the message of God dispensing grace to the Gentiles and salvation by grace was given to the Gentiles through Paul. That's the ministry he was given. And that's what he's talking about here. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Brother Ben verses one and two. Yeah. Renee said so much uh, it, with, with so little, <laughs> and I don't know how you do it. You're truly gifted Renee. Um, Yes, yeah, so Renee sums it up well, I think, uh, the last chapter where Paul, I think the theme in, in chapters one and two were about God reconciling all things uh, in heaven and on earth through Christ uh, or in Christ. And this uh, chapter it seems to be more uh, centered on the mystery of the church and the mystery as a word I think you'll see uh, throughout this chapter uh, just means something that wasn't previously revealed. Uh, it's not something that God really... Uh, there was really no type. I, I believe there's really no type for the church in the Old Testament. Um, maybe vague, very, very vague uh, allusions to it, but not really anything you could say. Oh, yeah, this this verse in the Old Testament is definitely talking about the, the church. Um, so uh, that's in my in my view, that's kind of what mystery is. It's something that not previously revealed enough. So it kind of goes in line with what Renee said about dispensation. Um, I, I agree that the dispensation simply just means uh, God's giving new. New information, uh, not not negating what he said in the past, but he's just giving new information. Um, and with regards to the dip, dispensation, and, and with regards to Paul's uh, relation to it, you know, Paul's uh, Paul's a steward, or it's his responsibility, a uh, unique responsibility, not unique, but special responsibility. Um, well, definitely unique among the apostles to preach to the Gentiles, and he says also too. That he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. I believe at this time, uh, I think Ephesians, you guys probably know more about this than I do, that Ephesians uh, is one of the uh, epistles that's known as Paul's prison letters or prison epistles. And so I think he actually was physically in, in, in prison at this time in Rome. Um, but what's interesting is that he doesn't say like, you know, oh, I'm a prisoner of the Ro Roman government or, or I'm a prisoner by man. He, he knows that it's all God's design for the sake of the Gentiles that he's in prison. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure there was some logistical reasons. Uh, if we thought about that, that we could find, okay, yeah, it makes sense that God would put him in jail. Uh, I'm sure there's some good reasons for it. Um, but that, uh, again, he says that he doesn't say he's a prisoner of Rome necessarily. He knows it, it's, it's God's doing and he's, he's ultimately a, a prisoner, if you will, or, or a, uh, he, he is, um, well, in some ways, we're a prisoner to the Lord in a, in a, in a positive sense that we're uh, we, we're we're servants of His, so we have a relationship with Him, an unbreakable chain, if you will, tied to Christ. So that's all I had. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you, brother. Um, well, just this word dispensation uh, could really set me off, and we could really do a probably four or five hour study just on that word and the concept of dispensationalism but uh, we don't want to go too far sidetrack but let me refer to a couple of things in the chat room though before i try to uh, answer um, these verses um, mike uh, asked that we pray for uh, his um, his mother you know, was exposed to covid and she uh, she's not really not feeling well, but she doesn't have the results. She's going to be tested 
So he wants us to pray that uh, she does not have COVID. She has a prior pre-existing condition, a heart condition. So please, everybody pray for uh, Michael's mother. Um, well, while we're on the subject of heart issues, heart conditions, um, I'm, I I want to just tell you from my own experience, uh, you know, I had quadruple bypass heart surgery uh, about three years ago, and I've been continuing to deal with some uh, follow-up problems. And uh, But recently, um, I ha had to take another test because uh, they feel that something's not right, so they always want to give me a test. And then I, I got online and found the test results today, and it was quite... Um, bad or when I read it it's uh, basically it was saying that uh, I have a, a high probability or what is uh, I'm a high risk for a stroke well I'd rather have a heart attack and die than and get a stroke and be you know you know have some permanent damage uh, but um, so that was how I felt today and, and then I get a phone call from my doctor's office and they're there uh, i'm thinking well that's why they're calling me to explain the misinterpreted the uh, results of the test uh um, turns out they were telling me that this is very good news because the condition i had be uh, before this test That we, uh, gosh, sorry. That was the reason uh, that why I had to have this test done. But um, turns out now the result of the test shows that my situation has improved dramatically. So rather than it getting worse and me worrying about it, it was really actually good news saying that the changes they've made in my medication have worked. And so, uh, this is a praise report, so thank you, Jesus. Thank Thanks. you, everybody, for all your prayers. But uh, I, as soon as she, they explained to me this, the test results, uh, and it was actually good, I, it was weird. I Immediately, I felt 10 years younger, in just, just like that. <laughs> it was wonderful. So um, I know, Michael. Uh, having a heart condition and you know how it work, can worry you your mother and and your family the other thing i want to address is a uh, church for the truth uh kevin uh thank you for acknowledging the video and uh I'm, I'm glad that you understand uh you know i finally spoke and, and, and explained my perspective on on the, the problem that we had been dealing with so i'm glad that that was helpful to you now getting back to the the verses in question here uh, this word dispensation it says if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God well first of all um, this word dispensation has been a, a single word that only appears three times maybe four I'm not I'm not sure if it's three or four times but um, an entire doctrinal system of Bible interpretation has developed around this word dispensation. And I, I think it's, it's, you know, uh, it's wrong in the, in the most basic form of dispensationalism. And that is that throughout history of man, there are periods of history where God had a different plan, a means of salvation for people. Uh, like we know right now, it's believing in Jesus and the gospel uh, and, and a free gift of eternal life. But uh, throughout history, uh, dispensationally teaches that no, God had a different means uh, and the means of salvation and uh, or God's method of solving our problem for salvation was different. It's changed in, in seven different times, as, as many as I'm, uh, most of them think that it's seven dispensations or periods. <clears throat> and that's wrong. But um, this book here, uh, Dispensational Truth by Clarence Larkin, it was written in 1918, I think. 
And it goes into great detail explaining this concept of dispensationalism, and it has charts and drawings to show you timelines of, of how they interpret uh, the, the um, dispensationalism. Uh, so it, it's, uh, to me, very unfortunate that they take a word dispensation, which should simply be understood as uh, the root word being dispense is to pass out or distribute something. If I'm dispensing you, let's say that I have a, a you know, a, a, a cake and I cut you a piece and I'm dispense a, a piece to Ben and I, I dispense a, a piece to Renee and so on to everybody. That's dispensing. Uh, and, and the suffix I-O-N or T-R-I-O-N means the act of. So dispensation literally translates to the act of dispensing or the act of distributing something. So uh, my conclusion about this word and, and the way we should understand this in the Bible is that it's um, uh, the act of distributing revelations to man about God's plan for salvation. And what's happened is that in the beginning, the very first part of, of God dispensing this was after the fall he said you can't cover your nakedness by yourself there uh, i have to provide the covering it's going to require death and shed blood and he provided an animal skin for adam and eve that was the beginning of dispensing to humanity god's plan and as as we go through the bible god built on that throughout all of history, a little bit more, a little bit more dispensing, a little bit more details. And, and now we have the full plan on, has been dispensed and we, we understand it perfectly. Uh, and that, uh, and that is God's plan was that he would provide himself a sacrifice for our sin himself. <laughs> That's what, it, how they phrase it in uh, when uh, Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. Uh, so God provided himself as a sacrifice um, all right, so that's the kind of the foundation of this word. And as we go through the next few verses, we're going to go into more detail about this word dispensation. And, and so, anybody want to add any more before we go to the next verse? Oh, I forgot to read it in the Amplified. So, let me read verse one and two in the Amplified. For this reason, that is, because I preach that you and believing Jews are joint heirs, I, Paul, am the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was entrusted to me to share with you for your benefit. Okay. All right. So we go to the next verse. Okay. Verse three, Ben, you can go first on this one. Verse three in the uh, KJV says, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He's going to tell us what this mystery is next, but let's not go jump ahead. Verse three and four, Ben. Uh, three and four, yes. Um, well, what he says, I, I uh, as I have briefly written already, uh, I believe he's referring back to the last chapter, verses 14 through 18 where he says, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who are near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So again, I think that's uh, what he's talking about. He, what he mentioned, he talked about it briefly before. This mystery was that God was going to create a new man out of uh, both Jew and Gentile, um, or bring them together, bring up that, bring that enmity to, together, because one was holy and one was unholy in some respects. Now, when I say the word holy, I mean only separate, separate. Uh, separate unto God. So the Jews were separate unto God. The Gentiles were not at that time. Uh, and so in the body of Christ, again, in keeping with the theme that God reconciled all things to himself, he uh, uh, basically uh, brought the, those two men together 
and created a, one new man, a perfect man, uh, mm -hmm. through the, the body in, or through the sacrifice of Christ. So that we can have perfect righteousness before God forever and be through the new birth. Okay, thank you, Ben. All right, Sister Renee, verses three and four. Yeah, we see shadows of this uh, with Gentiles like Naaman. Naaman, it doesn't appear that he took on any of the Jew, uh, Jewish religion. Uh, he took uh, dirt from Israel and said that he would have to go into the pagan temple of Rimmon or Raymond or Ramon or however you pr pronounce it, R-I-M-M-O-N, that his king <coughs> worshipped but that he wanted God to know that it wasn't him bowing down, that he was uh, made to do it uh, by helping the king bow down to his pagan gods, but that he would worship no other God, but the God of Israel. So we see salvation by faith uh, with Naaman. Uh, so Jesus speaks of this mystery. Okay. He mentions it uh, in the book of John. Uh, we see a couple of places in the Old Testament where he says, you know, that I will make a people that are not a people. I will have a people that are not a people or something like that. And then this mystery is spoken about by Jesus in John 16. And he says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So he, he mentions that it's a people other than the Jews. They're not of this fold, uh, but they will be, it'll be one group of people under one shepherd. So he mentions this mystery. Again, though, it's, it's in shadows and it's kind of hidden. Uh, it is a mystery. And now that we have full revelation of it, we can see, we can go back to the prophets and see that that's come to life. <clears throat> and Paul says how that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four and few words, like uh, Ben was telling you, he also wrote about it extensively in Romans, the book of Romans, I think it's chapter 11. Um, gosh, there's a lot of verses people take out of context in that section. Uh, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So, Rightfully so, it was a mystery. It was not commonly known. As far as the Jews knew, uh, you know, Gentiles made them uh, unclean and they had to stay separate from them. And it's one of the reasons Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan and how the Levite walked to the other side of the street. He didn't care that the guy was dying or needed assistance as long as he stayed ritually clean. Like that, that's how religious these people were. It's like they, they, they strained out a net and swallowed a camel. So it, they couldn't see how wicked and black their hearts were having no compassion for a person, but that they were concerned about being unclean because they might touch that guy and he might be dead or close to it. We don't want to be ritually unclean touching a dead body. So Jesus pointed out the hypocrisy uh, of the religious, but it was based on the fact that Gentiles were unclean. Uh, and so this is a big deal. It would have been a big deal to the Jews that none of their rituals, their dead religious work in Hebrews, uh, were reconciling them to God, nor were they necessary. Uh, and so the revelation that Gentiles were also accepted to God and clean by grace alone through faith alone was, was a mystery and it and it was would have been a really big deal and that's why there's so much fighting about it and so much legalism and judaizers coming into the early church and by the way they're still here mm -hmm. okay thank you uh, i guess i'll i'll read those verses in the amplified first uh, three and four says and that by divine revelation, the mystery was made known to me, as I have already written in brief. By referring to this, when you read it, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Uh, okay, so there's now we got another word. We had dispensation, and now we have mystery. 
Well, by the way, let me back up to dispensation to make an, a point clear. Uh, like other subjects of the Bible, um, uh, it's, it's not so clear cut what dispensationalism is because there are degrees of it. Just like in Calvinism, a person um, could be a six point Calvinism. That means they, they believe in um, uh, God's sovereign determinism. Man does not have free will along with the five points of Tulip. That would be a full six point Calvinist. And then there are some Calvinists that say I'm a four point Calvinist or a three point Calvinist where they agree with, you know, most of it or a lot of it, but not, not all. It's the same thing with dispensationalism or a dispensationalist. It's not necessarily one thing, but, but, um, what I've spoken out against is not the basic dispensationalism that it really is that, that, that today, uh, since the cross and, and until the uh, rapture, that period of time is called the church age or the age of grace, dispensation of the grace of God. During this time of history, uh, God offers salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. So, uh, that that I don't have a problem with, uh, even though some of them will say, well, th th there was no grace in previous times before the cross. There will be no grace in the tribulation or the millennial period. It's going to be some kind of work system instead. Even though I think it's wrong, what matters to me is that none of us are teaching that today, at this present time, that a person uh, has to have works to accompany their their faith uh, for salvation. So if a, if someone is a dispensationalist and agrees with us on that, and yet they think that in times past or in the future that it's going to be faith and works, I can live with that. Uh, it, you know, that doesn't bother me as much, even though I think it's wrong. But where they really go wrong is hyper dispensationalism or ultra dispensationalism where they go so far as to say that you can't get saved by reading the Gospel of John or nowhere in the Bible can you found, find salvation, uh, the Gospel, except in uh, Paul's writings, particularly uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Um, so, uh, they, in other words, they're paul only -ists. Paul's the only one that you can learn about salvation. You can't learn it from John or Peter, not even Jesus can teach you about salvation, and it has to be Paul. So this is how far that some of them take it, and this is where we have a, a, an issue against against that form of dispensationalism. Uh, but the mystery is another thing, because one of the things that some of these dispensationalists argue is that the mystery is that, um, uh, that now, all of a sudden, God is going to be gracious and, 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 and offer grace to everybody, salvation by grace. Uh, uh, in other words, they say there was no grace before the cross. There will be no grace after the rapture. It's, this is the only period of history where the, God's being gracious. Uh, they say that's the mystery. That's just how they teach it. But that's wrong because as we you're going to see in the next couple of verses, the mystery is not that now all of a sudden God decides to be gracious. Um, so uh, let me see. Is there anything on those verses? Uh, no, I, I guess I don't need to go into any more detail than that. Uh, any, ben or, or Renee, you want to say any more on verse 3 and 4? Okay, let's go to verse uh, 5. And Renee, you'll go first on this. It says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, I'll read six with it because this is the answer to, well, what is this mystery? Uh, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So verse five and six, and you have the answer in verse six to what this mystery is. So yeah. sorry. Somebody in the chat made a good point. Uh, I remember Peter, when he went to Cornelius's house, uh, that the Jews were kind of like shocked. But Peter's like, who am I to withstand God? He gave him the same power of the Holy Spirit he gave us. Uh, I was preaching the gospel to him. God told me not to call anything unclean that he made clean. 
So I went to his house and preached the gospel. And while I was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell. So who am I to withstand God? And so they're like, hey, well, I guess, you know, God's given it to the Gentiles just like us. So they were shocked about that. That was new to them. So this really was a mystery. And by the way, many of these Jews were slow to receive this. They don't like it. It's pride. And it's also why some of them uh, remain under the Old Testament law and temple system. They like the power they had uh, being a go-between to God. And they didn't like that system being done away with. And they fought for it tooth and nail. And they certainly didn't want Gentiles to have access to God. So this was uh, new news for them. So which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. So uh, it tells us, Paul told us that in the past, God winked at their ignorance. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent, to change their minds, turn from their idols and trust in Christ. Uh, so it wasn't made known. It was not something that was understood as everybody has said here. It is a mystery and is now revealed into his holy apostles and prophets by the capital S spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And this is why it is so important to know what that gospel is. There is only one gospel message. Now people see things like the gospel of John, the gospel of Mark. That just means the good news of John. Okay, or the good news according to John. But the gospel is the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God, the good news that Jesus died for their sins, that he was buried and he rose again on the third day, that all the prophets foretold it. And uh, it's it's come. It's done. And so when it says. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, the gospel. It's important that we preach the right gospel or they won't be fellow heirs. Because there, there's only one gospel message. And unfortunately, with the plethora of churches and denominations, they all got another gospel. They got a piece of the true gospel. But the gospel is, is, is very rare. And that's why we fight for it here. It's very important to know the promise of inheritance and eternal life by the gospel. And the gospel is what Christ has done to redeem man and reconcile him to God in himself. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Uh, Brother Ben, I'm... I, in the past, I'd always uh, uh, read the Amplified um, before Cripps would uh, comment. I don't know if you want me to do that for you or or, or are you not? Uh, what do you prefer? Uh, it's not necessary for me. Um, All right, then go ahead. Yep. So, uh, okay. Again, I, I, I do like the King, new King James, however. Um, so I hope that can, can be tolerated. <laughs> um, the... Yeah, so Renee once again said it well, um, but uh, you know what's interesting is that if we think about if you think about it, uh, you know if we take if we uh, if we agree with the idea that the, the, a mystery is something that when the, when the Bible says mystery, it means something that not that was not previously revealed. Like you couldn't even the best student of the, of the Bible could not glean it from what was previously uh, dispensed <laughs> uh, or, or revealed. And so, uh, if you want, if you want to really parse it out, and I don't think it's that big of a deal, but I'm just for the sake of of getting down to the nitty gritty of the scripture here, um, I believe the mystery was not that the Gentiles would, would be saved, because Genesis three fifteen, uh, I think that's what some people refer to as the proto evangelon. Uh, I think that's what they call it, where it says, you know, uh, I I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head. And you shall bruise his heel, and then also there's other verses too in the Old Testament talk about the Gentiles will see his light. Um, so I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, convinced that that the uh, 
the gift of eternal life being available to Gentiles was a mystery per se, but that, but the fact um, that I'm just looking at the scripture here, um, the, but the fact that they would be fellow heirs with Israel, the promises made to Israel through Christ, I believe that was actually the mystery that Paul may be referring to. And the fact that the, so the mystery essentially is not necessarily salvation uh, being be, be, be made available to the entire world, but the fact that the, that uh, there would be a church that would be uh, uh, the body of Christ that would be co comprised of both Jews and Gentiles, that was not revealed in the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, it's barely hinted at, even in the synoptics. There's two references of it in Matthew uh, about, about a church. And even then, I, uh, I think, I, I know there's some debate as to whether or not that's actually referring to the church or just a, a general assembly of of uh, like a general congregation either way um the church was a mystery i believe and the fact that the, the gentiles would be fellow heirs with christ um or with the jews is um the jews who believe that is uh that that was a mystery and um also too is that with regards to big heirs i believe scripture teaches that all believers in christ will have an inheritance but there's also what re the scripture sometimes refers to as the reward of the inheritance. So, for example, if I'm uh, if I'm on my if I'm an old man, uh, you know, I've lived my long life. I'm 100 years old. I'm on my deathbed. But the last five years, I really had a, uh, a, a, a I really struggled with illness and, and uh, I was basically dying. If I had a son, for example, if I had two sons and one of them uh, stuck by my side all through, the you know, uh, uh, assisting me in my, uh, you know, you know, bathing me, feeding me, all that kind of stuff. But he basically gave up his entire life to support me. And yet another son didn't do that. Um, both sons will, I, I would lavish both sons with my inheritance, but the one who served me in a special way, uh, uh, you know, he would get above something above and beyond. So I believe that's what scripture refers to as the reward of the inheritance, but all, all believers will have an inheritance. So that's all I have. Hmm. Okay, I'll read five and six in the uh, uh, Amplified. It says, uh, uh, which, and now this is talking about this mystery, which in other generations was not disclosed to mankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so one, it says it's been revealed to his holy apostles, not only to the Apostle Paul, see? So uh, that's where an, another era of hyper-dispensationalism, that they think that Paul was the only one that had this. But it says here that this mystery, that the, uh, what is the mystery? I, I think it's clear that in verse 6, he says what the mystery is, uh, because he says, um, for verse 5 and 6 in the KGV says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. So this is, uh, Paul tell us that there's a mystery and that the mystery is the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. So that the Gentiles will also be offered salvation and there will be one body, Jews and Gentiles together uh, in one body. Uh, so that he tells us what the mystery is there. Um, let me go back to the Amplified. It says, um, um, it is this, that the Gentiles are now joint heirs with the Jews and members of the same body and joint partakers sharing in the same divine promise in Christ Jesus through their faith in the good news of salvation. So, see, the, we, we're talking about uh, a related subject on Friday night. I'm going to just turn it off if I can. I try to keep it on in case Ben needs to send me a message or something, but uh, it's too distracting. So give me a second to just turn it off. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so Friday night we had a question, true or false, about um, is uh, eternal security uh, essential? Understanding and believing in eternal security, is it essential uh, for salvation? 
Does a person have to understand and believe that they have eternal security uh, for to get uh, salvation? And I was surprised that we had some people that did not think that eternal security is uh, necessary uh, because uh, I, I believe you don't have a gospel without eternal security. Um, the eternal security is is the, the promise or the guarantee that you are going to go to heaven and you have eternal life. It's guaranteed. It's promised to you by Jesus who cannot lie or break a promise. Um, so the problem is if we think that the gospel is only uh, acknowledgement uh, that Jesus paid for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead, uh, and if a person understands and believes that, but is not connecting that to the promise that, and because of that, I have eternal life guaranteed to me. Without the promise and the guarantee of eternal life, you only have this fact that Jesus paid for your sins. Well, so what? He paid for my sins. Ask Roman Catholics, ask uh, many people, are, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? And why? Based on what? And the Roman Catholics will say, uh, well, I don't know. You can't really be certain, can you? Even though the Roman Catholic will say, of course I believe Jesus paid for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. But if you ask them about, are you going to go to heaven? They don't know. They they got their fingers crossed. They're hoping. And why? Based upon personal merit. Well, I think I've been good enough. I go to church all the time or so on. I, 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 I. So um, w without understanding that the death, burial, and resurrection accomplished eternal life for you and that you have it you have eternal life because jesus accomplished it by his uh, death burial and resurrection you don't have a, a gospel you which means good news and i think these verses here confirm this because it's saying uh in um uh, verse six it says uh partakers of his promise in christ no that the gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So without the promise, you don't have a gospel. It's not good news unless you realize that uh, um, I, I'm going to go to heaven. It's guaranteed. And it, Jesus, the, what the cross and the resurrection did was, this is how Jesus accomplished it for me by paying for my sins so that the sin is not a a barrier preventing me from coming to God and getting the gift of eternal life. Um, and um, all right, let me see. I think I covered the points. All right. Do you guys want to respond to five and six any, any further? But no. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the KJV for, for the next verse. Uh, verse seven i think whose turn is to go first this time renee or ben ben okay ben verse seven whereof i was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of god given unto me by the effectual working of his power okay ben well uh we definitely know his ministry was given by grace by the grace of god uh, God, you know, Paul was even seeking Jesus. In fact, he was seeking to destroy that religion. And so uh, God uh, gave him, you know, he he stepped right into his life, literally, and uh, and gave him the gospel. And he, so uh, Paul's gospel was by, through divine revelation, purely by the grace of God. He wasn't seeking him at all. He wasn't. In fact, he was trying to do good works to please God because he, he was a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So um it absolutely was a grace of God, and that's um, it, it, it. That's the way it, it makes sense. That it would be that way because He is the Apostle of Grace to the Gentiles. So, not much I can get out of that verse other beyond that. Okay, Renee. Yeah, I, I'd agree with him here. Whereof I was made a minister, but I, I think it's important to say what, he was made a minister of what of the gospel to the Gentiles. And again, you got to know what that gospel is, uh, or you have no understanding of the promise in Christ or an inheritance in Christ, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me 
by the effectual working of his power. So, you know, Paul is uh, letting it be known that uh, any power that he has um, is given to him by God's grace. His ability to be effective in the ministry of preaching the gospel of grace to uh, the Gentiles is also a grace of God given to him. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me look at it in the uh, Amplified. Verse 7 says, uh, Of this gospel, I was made a minister by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Yeah, he talked earlier about uh, how uh, he didn't get the gospel, or was that in... Uh, was that in uh, Galatians uh, that he didn't he wasn't taught by man he was taught by God directly um, all right I don't really need to add any more to that so let's go to back to the KJV verse 8 ready it'll be your turn it says unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ yeah, I, I wish more people preached on that. You know, there, there's never any good news preached in any of the pulpits. They're wrong on the gospel. And then they'll preach their PowerPoint system of how to grow closer to God, uh, which isn't even scriptural. So uh, I think all these things would happen automatically if they would preach. Uh, how does he put that? Unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, people are always trying to limit God's grace, limit his love, limit his gift. They're always trying to find a loophole or a way that you can lose it or give it back. They want bad news. Uh, but instead, we should be preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. So I, I like here the reason he says that who, who am less than the least of all the saints. I, I believe this because he persecuted the church. Uh, he has a healthy um, self-deprecation attitude that anything that he does is truly by God's grace because he was blinded out of his zeal for the Jews' religion. He persecuted and even killed the saints. So he always refers to himself as the least of the apostles or not worthy to be an apostle. And here he's calling himself the least of all saints. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? I, I really wish uh, more of that was preached. Uh, the saints need to be edified, lifted up, encouraged. But all, all they get is fear, condemnation, work salvation, uh, God's wrath. It, it's just really sad that nobody's preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The unsearchable riches. Well, that's something that we'll never understand all of the riches. Uh, it can be mind boggling when you even start to think about it. Uh, um, uh, ben, what's your. Yeah. The well, yeah, I think like Brene said, um, yeah, the, people never talk about what you know. Paul called himself the the chief of sinners, um, and Paul never forgot that. Paul always remained humble, um, knew that there was nothing good, no, nothing good in him. There was nothing good dwelt in him. That is his flesh, and he knew that. And just like I think all of us, uh, you know, I, I, I. I yeah, I've been a lot, lots of really uh, surprised by the the interpretations people come with, and, and people are okay with. Like, someone will share their interpretation of scripture, uh, or something to the effect like they'll share their interpretation of scripture, and, and they'll say something like, "Oh, we'll see. A, a believer would never do that, so it can't be talking about a believer." I was like, "Are you kidding me? I mean, I, you must not be fully in touch with your your the wickedness of your own heart." And um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I think given enough time in the right circumstances. Even believers are, are are capable of every sin in the book, um, given again, given the right time, enough time, the right circumstances. Um, the only good in us is Christ, and 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 even then we have to we have to lean on that. Uh, we have to walk in that, 
Um, and it, it, not all believers do at all times. So um, we can, you know, if we're not walking the spirit, then we're automatically defaulting in the flesh and in the flesh uh, it says it grows corrupt. So I, I love Paul's humi humility. Um, I, I can definitely relate with it. Uh, it comforts me. And uh, when he says unsearch unsearchable uh, riches in Christ, well, you know, through Christ, we have access to all all that is God. Everything that God has, we, we have access to. Now, obviously, we, we can't fully uh, experience it this side of heaven. Um, but um, unsearchable also means like it can't be fully explored. Like, I, I think, you know, not for sure in this life, we'll never fully understand uh, all, all of who Christ is and all of who God is and who we are in him. Um, but even in, even when we are, uh, resurrected, I think we'll spend eternity exploring God and, and all that he is. Um, and with the regards to the fellowship of the mystery, again, I think the fellowship of the mystery is the, the church where, uh, both believing Jews and believing Gentiles are one in Christ. Okay, uh, I want to look at it uh, in the Amplified verse, uh, verse 8 says, um, no, are we on 8 or 9? What, what verse are we on? Not 8? Yeah, it's verse 8, okay. To me... Though I am the very least of all the saints, that is, God's people, this grace, which is undeserved, was graciously given to proclaim to the Gentiles the good news of the incomprehensible riches of Christ, that spiritual wealth which no one can fully understand. Yeah, uh, obviously, um, there's so much we can, can't understand now, but I'm hopeful that uh, in eternity uh, we'll understand not everything because we'll never be omniscient as God is, but uh, certainly uh, we're going to understand so much more. And I, I get such a thrill every time I understand something now. I can imagine going through eternity and having the truth over and over again revealed so that I understand more and more. That's very exciting to me. Um, there is a footnote here I see on verse 3 and 4 talking about that mystery again. And, and the uh, it is agreed here. It says the mystery is God's resolve to deliver Gentiles along with Israel through Christ. Uh, all right, let's go. Any more on verse 8? Okay, verse 9 says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ben, is it your turn to go first? Well, I, I, I actually, I thought I was addressing three and eight, eight, eight and nine last time, but uh, so I don't have a whole lot to add. The only thing I was thinking of is that, you know, it seems that like God does hide all good things. Um, you know, Christ was uh, uh, hidden in, in his childhood, so to speak. So that uh, while well, he's hidden from the, uh, you know, he went, was de departed for Egypt, so he was hidden in that respect. Um, but also, too, just his whole life, uh, he was hidden. His, his own brothers didn't know who he was uh, growing up. Um, and I think there's a verse that I think it's in one of the Psalms talk about Christ being uh, hit uh, an arrow hidden in God's quiver or something to that effect. Um, and then also too is that our life is hidden in Christ. So it's oh, it's like it's hidden. It's like God's special protection. Um, and even the gospel was hidden in the Old Testament. Um, the it, it not the, the gospel in terms of the mystery of the church. Um, and so again, I, I, God, I think God hides all things, and so that even a person uh, is look seeking for God, seeking God, they won't find. They won't know. They can't discover the gospel through general revelation, they need to have a special revelation uh, that I, I'm, I'm convinced God will provide it if, uh, well, he, he, I'm convinced he provides it for anyone who will receive it, so. All right, thank you. Uh, Sister Renee, verse nine. Yeah, I, I wanna uh, say something here uh, on, on this verse. Shoot, it's on 10. <laughs> All right. 
All right, and to make all men, and in 10, it, it'll, I have a good point to make, but this is part of it too. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. And there's a reason it was hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So on the next one, we're going to talk about why it was hid in God, why this was a hidden mystery and not made known uh, blatantly. It was important that it be done that way. All right. If you'd like, just go ahead and read 10 and connect them together. Yeah. Okay. So it says, Hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that is now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. So he hid this from Satan and his kingdom, lest Satan interfere in some way. Now we see that Satan set up every religion on the planet. Satan is responsible for all of it. The mother child cults of the ancient world, all the false uh, pagan um, pluralities of gods and divinities. Uh, Satan knew bits and pieces. He understood the virgin birth. That's why there's virgin stories told before even the Torah came out. He knew that prophecy. He heard it given uh, to Eve and to the serpent. He heard it. So he got ahead of it and tried to corrupt it. And by the way, that's upsetting a lot of Christians because they're being told Jesus and Mary, it's the same pagan story. It's not true. It, there were stories before Jesus and Mary. So they don't understand that Satan got ahead of it trying to work because he wants to be like the most high. So he imitates him. Uh, and so here we see that God had hidden this truth. And, and we see in Colossians 2.15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So when he was crucified and used Satan's plan to kill him against him to redeem man, wow. I mean, he is glorified. He had Satan destroy himself with his own wicked uh, uh, wickedness. He used the evil against him to foil his plans. And so this was another mystery hid in God until the fullness of God's timing. And you see the principalities and powers mentioned here that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And we see in Colossians having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. So um, all of uh, Satan's kingdom, these powerful principalities and powers, they had no idea uh, God had his reasons for keeping the Gentiles and the Jews uh, being one new man in Christ and having them be reconciled unto, unto him by Jesus. Uh, this all had to be hidden. His plan could not be revealed until God's timing. And he used this, their ignorance, to make his plans come to fruition. And he triumphed over these powerful and entities in so much that uh, he made a show of them openly. And it reminds me of when he says that the plagues on Egypt were to punish the gods of Egypt. And so I believe that he kept this uh, secret for that purpose. One of the reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Uh, maybe you can tell me where that verse is, where, um, I, I think it's Paul that, that says that uh, if uh, uh, if it hadn't been kept secret, that uh, Christ would not have been crucified. Yeah, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. I'll look that up. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read the um, 9 and 10 together. Ben, I'll let you comment on 10 after I'm done here, but uh, 9 and 10, I'm going to read them together in the Amplified. It said, and to make plain to everyone, the plan of the mystery, that is, regarding the uniting of the believing Jews and Gentiles into one body, which until now was kept hidden 
through the ages in the mind of God who created all things. So now through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God in all its countless aspects might be made known, uh, that is revealing the mystery, to the angelic rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So I think that last portion of that verse 10 is also uh, connected to the verse Renee's looking up because uh, God did not want the uh, angelic forces or Satan and uh, uh, them to, to know this plan because he needed them to actually assist in, in causing uh, this, uh, this death on the cross to happen. Um, uh, Sister Renee, did you find that verse? Yes, it's in 1 Corinthians 2.8. Uh, it says, which none of the princes of this world knew. And by the way, anytime you see stuff like this, princes of this world, it's not talking about human princes. It's talking about principalities, uh, ruling entities over uh, a territory. None of the princes of this world knew, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right, Ben, do you want to comment on 10 now? Sure. Um, so I'm just kind of thinking out loud here because uh, Renee sent my mind reeling. I'm still kind of recovering from it. But yes, I think that's, that is a, a very profound um, uh, thing that has happened that I believe there were, there were sons of God, angelic uh, sons of God, and I believe the sons of God, it was really, for them, it was more of a title. Uh, because, I, again, all through Scripture, I see a pattern where God takes something, uh, a weaker thing, and makes it stronger. So uh, so he, he's always, in the, he's always in, the, in the business of making something better. So they were, I believe they were the sons of God in title only, really, uh, in, in, that, in that they had uh, co-ruling uh, responsibility, or they were delegated certain tasks to, to rule in heaven um, and, but they fell, some of them fell. And, um, and when they fell, I think, um, well, I think they had full access. To, I, again, I'm just thinking out loud here. I think they had full access to God. And so they knew his character, uh, but when they fell, I'm wondering if they lost some of that knowledge, they became blind to the goodness of God. Uh, cause I, 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 cause for example, I mentioned before that, um, uh, that, that I saw that, you know, uh, I noticed that the Pharisees and the Jews in general, they were blind to the goodness of God. They were blind to mercy and love and, and the goodness of God. They just saw, they they, they literally just saw things their, with, with their own eyes, physical eyes. And so they never thought of spiritual matters. They always thought of what they could see, taste, and touch. And uh, and what they were focused on was the law. And the law was, you know, it, pu it puffed them up. They thought they were keeping it. They would twist the law to to, to accommodate so they could keep it essentially, because uh, you know, they knew they couldn't keep it, but they uh, would twist it so they could, um, and you know, twist it to their own um, destruction, really. But um, the, the I th again, the, I think they were blind to God's uh, grace and mercy because they they didn't see uh, well, they didn't recognize Christ for who He was. And I, but I also think the the uh, the spiritual realm also became blind to God's goodness and mercy because like Renee said, had they known uh, what, what Christ death would accomplish uh, it would really ultimately be their undoing. I don't think they would have ever done it. Um, so I think they, they did become blind after they fell. And another a, a, a point, another, as I was thinking that there's a verse in second uh, Peter one, where it says, where Peter basically says, okay, add to your faith, all these things. And if you do that, you'll never stumble, which I, I take stumble mean to fall into apostasy, essentially. And um, and he says that that a person who doesn't have these things that I'm asking you to, I'm, I'm admonishing to you to build on your faith, like virtue, kindness, brotherly love, et cetera. If you don't have, anyone who does not have those things, a, a born again believer who does not have those things, he has become blind and, has, and, and doesn't even know wh uh, who he is. He doesn't know that he's a son of God. Uh, he's going to be, become completely blind to who he who he is, and so um, I think that that same principle could be applied to the fall. Where again, I think Satan and uh, all the angelic hosts they knew the goodness of God, but they lost some of that knowledge um, or became blind to it essentially um, when they fell. And 
And so I think it would. Uh, they said they they we, uh, Christ despoiled them. Well, their 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 uh, gain. They thought I think was that they, their gain was they thought that again that they had this world to their own. They could rule it, and they they through their deception and uh, corrupt governance of mankind uh, through their false religious systems and whatnot. Uh, they deceived man, and they thought that you know oh well man yep man's condemned. Um, and they thought they could have the, their way with us, essentially. So, in that sense, they thought you know we were condemned, and we were we were their meat puppets, essentially, and that we could do whatever they want. Uh, and that's I think that's essentially true today for unbelievers. Um, but through the through the Christ's work, uh, and whoever believes on Him, they are set free in that sense. Um, and so, it, it, this world is it's condemned already. The God of this world's condemned, and so it was their undoing. And in that sense. Um, well, how would the word phrase what's the first say? Um, yeah, the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think I said everything got what I wanted to say in that point. So okay. all right. Uh, I'm gonna read verse eleven uh, and twelve together. Uh, uh, it says, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Okay. Uh, whose turn is to go first? All right, Renee. Yeah, I, I think so. I was just trying to say, I don't remember, but all right, let me. All right. Uh, we're on 11. Did you just stop at no, 11? No, 11 and 12 together? According to. All right. So let me let me go back up to 10 to the intent that now into the principalities and powers in heavenly place might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness. I love that. And access with confidence by the faith of him see again people it's not your faith like god's not faithful because your faith is so faithful it's like, i wish people would get this uh but it says that it, it was kept a mystery and, and known uh according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in christ jesus our lord again he couldn't let the purpose of christ the full purpose of his death burial and resurrection be known uh, and because he's done that, because of what he accomplished on Calvary, putting him to a shame, uh, redeeming us and all the promises that come with it, uh, the unsearchable rich, rich, uh, riches in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. When we are in Christ, it is his faith. It is his faithfulness it is his righteousness it is everything is what he accomplished and we are in him and it's imputed unto us so we have confidence and boldness not because of what we do i was just saying in the chat i have to constantly remind myself of god's righteousness because on my best day i still see how i fail you know these lordship people they look at a day in my life and go wow she you know she does live her faith. You know, they put a little nose down at me. She lives her faith. Okay. She she didn't steal. She didn't fornicate. She didn't get drunk. You know, I, I didn't sin according to their standards. But I know I had uh, foolish thoughts and thoughts I shouldn't have had. And I was lazy. And I could have done more to know good and to do it not. And all other kinds of ways I fail. And so the reason I have boldness uh in god's presence is because of jesus my redeemer not because of me on my on my best day i'd fail uh, i can never i heard a catholic priest once say he couldn't be an exorcist because he wasn't holy enough and i was like wow this guy's real thank goodness he's not because he's relying on his own holiness and his own righteousness to be able to withstand the enemy you better be resting in Jesus's because they can't accuse him. They can accuse you, but they can't accuse Jesus. So they cannot accuse you. Who can lay a charge to God's elect? It's God who justifies. 
It's always him. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Brother Ben, those two verses. Yes, uh, to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. I, I, again, um, I think a lot of people too, a lot of believers will uh, think that, he, you know, God did love us. No, there's no doubt. I, he, in, immeasurable love for us, uh, for the lost and the, 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 belie the and believers. But um, ultimately, again, his, his eternal purpose was uh, he, he got to the business of getting glory for himself. And so... Um, and it's not a superficial glory. It's 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 actual real glory, and uh, the, what he had to do to redeem us uh, obviously glorifies him. And that he could take uh, an unnumerable number of of hell bound sinners and and glorify them and make them righteous. I mean that's that's incredible glory. And again, he did it, he did it primarily uh, for for his own eternal purpose. Uh, uh, not necessarily for your sake. Yes, he did it for your sake, but you, you're kind of the benefactor of it as a believer. Um, but ultimately, he's doing it for his eternal purpose. And you know, God does. God saves not based on works, and that's why we're not saved by works. But we're saved based on His own purpose. Um, that's what Second uh, Second Timothy uh, one nineteen says, um, uh, where he says, uh, "Who has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose." and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Um, so again, a lot, there's a lot of teaching out there. We'll say, oh, well, y y a believer, well, they might fall into error, but they won't fall into an error that would uh, cause them to ever, ever doubt or stop believing. It's like, okay, well, you, what do you think more is important to God? An error that would cause you to, what, what, what do you think is more important to God? Your faith as being a witness to the world about your not not what you have faith in, but your actual faith is that a, a better witness uh, and testimony to the world, or a believer who goes into grave error? They still don't ever, they don't still doubt their salvation, but they start believing something like um, I don't know uh, that Jesus had a wife or something. I mean, um, or something that would a, a kind of a, a assault his character. Not, not that Jesus couldn't have a, a wife, but uh, that wasn't a very good example. But anyhow. Um, Again, it's not about you. It's about what Christ did. It's all it's all about Christ. And whenever someone tries to put the focus on the believer, um, the, the alarm bell should go off because uh, it's not about the it's not about you. It's about about Christ. So, oops. Uh, those who have been following all of our Bible studies uh, through the Pauline epistles, you've heard me make this point before. Uh, so there is this phrase that we have seen before, and now it here, it's here again. It says, by the faith of him, or in, I think it says, by the faith of Christ uh, in, a, in 1 Corinthians. Um and I, I argued then, and I'll, I'll say it again, that uh, I, I don't think it should be interpreted at, in that way. As a matter of fact, a lot of modern translations, they will uh, call it either the faith in him, faith in Christ, or the faithfulness of Christ, rather than the faith of Christ. That's what I just put there, faithfulness in capital letters in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Good, because I don't believe that that uh, it's possible that we or we should even consider that Jesus had faith. Because what is faith? And there is a definition for it in the Bible. It says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, um, if um, if it's something you haven't seen, like we haven't seen Christ. But we believe in him anyway, so that that's faith. Uh, even though we didn't see him and touch him, we don't have that kind of uh, uh, you know substantial uh, test for, for our faith. So it's it's faith, not not knowledge. That's why I've said that I don't think that uh, Thomas, when he got to see and touch Jesus, put his finger in his wounds and said, "Now I believe." Um, I don't think that was faith because Jesus appeared and showed it showed himself to him. So it wasn't faith. He, he got to see him. I mean, after all, it says uh, uh, 
we walk by faith, not by sight. And so faith, you can't see something and have faith. Once you see it, it's not faith anymore because it's become knowledge instead of faith. Um, and, and also it would mean that God is not omniscient uh, if he has faith rather than knowledge. Uh, so for that reason, I don't think it's right to interpret it as the faith of Christ or the faith of him. If you look at uh, it in the Amplified, it does say, in whom we have boldness and confidence, uh, confident access through faith in him. That is, our faith gives us sufficient courage to freely and openly approach God through Christ. So there they interpret it as faith in, and the NABRE also, it says, uh, through faith in him. Um, so uh, it, it is either, I think it should be understood is because of the, our faith in Christ, uh, or it's because of Christ's faithfulness, but it should not be understood the faith of Christ. I mean, there are people that want to talk about the, the Christ's faith and that we get Christ's faith, and that's why it's impossible for it to fail because it's not our faith, it's his faith. But I, I, I disagree with that. I don't think Christ had faith. I don't think God has faith. God has knowledge. So we need to understand it some other way unless we want to discard God's omniscience. Well, um, I think he says uh, and the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. I think when he says the faith of Christ, he's, he's talking about uh, the faith of Christ. It's like those that believe on Christ. Uh, but also the faithfulness. I, I would agree with that, that we rely upon the faithfulness of Jesus as we're in him. But when it says we're, we're, we're justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. So it's clear there that the faith of Christ is to have faith in what Jesus has done uh, in that verse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, but my point about uh, God uh, or Jesus or the Father, that they can't have faith. If, no. if they have faith, that means that they're not omniscient. He knew, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me go back to uh, the uh, KJV for the next verse. Uh, verse 13, it says, Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So 13 and 14, Brother Ben. Yeah, uh, I, I want to follow up on something you guys said about the faith of Christ, faith in Christ. Um, I, I agree with you. It can be called, taken multiple ways, but it can't be taken to suggest that uh, that God gives you his faith. Uh, it makes no sense at all. There's no scripture that backs it up whatsoever. Uh, and there's clear verses. Uh, I think we are, we are all 100% agreement here on this panel that apostasy is not something to be encouraged or and it's in fact something we should be on watch out on the, on the watch for, make sure that none of us drift away, but it is a real possibility. And, uh, and the scripture clearly teaches that. Um, and, um, and so if God were to give you his faith, uh, first of all, there's no scripture that, that, that even alludes to that, but also too, is that anything God does, it gives, uh, is ir irrevocable. So it, it, if it was, if God gave you his faith, then that would make apostasy impossible. Cause, uh, Again, all the, all the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Um, but back on to this verse here, uh, also, too, with, the, with regards to faith and faith of, uh, I think it's interesting is that there's a parable. Uh, I think it's either in Luke or Matthew or maybe in Mark. And maybe it's in all three. I don't remember. But uh, Jesus says, who is that wise and faithful servant? Um, and he was talking to the there was, at that time, the, there was a, a the. There's a the the in the context you could there's a multitude around him and then also the uh the 12 disciples and I think it was Peter said Lord do you say this to us or to the multitudes you and in other words are you asking who is that wise and faithful servant are you saying it to us or are you saying it to the multitudes and curiously Christ does not answer it and I I'm convinced the reason he doesn't answer it is because only he is that wise and faithful servant um and that's why you need to be in him uh, so you could also be counted as wise and faithful and righteous. Uh, but with respect to these verses here, um, what's interesting is, I, and I'm sure this is significant because I believe every 
every word uh, is God breathed in the Bible and it's all of it is uh, we, we shall live by every word of it. And, and, but I don't know what the significance is of yet, but I, I did find this. I, I, I like to find patterns of scripture. And if you look at verse one in, in um, chapter three, we, which we read says it, verse one in Ephesians three, verse one says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. And it has a hyphen. And then it's almost like he, he, he stops that train of thought and then it kind of talks it to, um, so for, in other words, for that reason is tying back to what he talked about earlier in the previous chapter about uh, all things being reconciled to Christ. But then he kind of breaks into the idea of, oh, well, I'm a prisoner for Jesus Christ you, for you Gentiles. And he kind of explains that. And then now in, in verse, um, uh, it, in, I'm sorry, where is it at here? Oh, yes. In verse 14, he says again, for this reason, it's almost like he's resuming uh, this 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 uh, discourse. Um, and so it's almost like he was about to pray and he made but he stopped praying for a second or halted his prayer and then did some explanatory stuff, uh, which we just read. And now he's back to his prayer and it, it is to the father. Uh, and uh, it's just is, are we just going to four, verse 14. Yeah. OK. Okay, I'll stop there then. Sorry. All right, Renee, verse 13 and 14. Yeah, I think uh, here uh, we're going to go back. And whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And Ben was mentioning earlier, you believe this is one of the prison epistles where he was still imprisoned in Rome. Uh, which he, by the way, did not have to do. He was free to go, but he demanded to be before Caesar. He knew God had called him to preach in Rome, so he got himself a free trip to Rome. It was a long trip. Uh, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I desire you not faint at my tribulations for you or the things that he's going through for them. Uh, and it's their glory. They can boast in his love for them. He can, they can boast in what Paul has gone through uh, for the church. Uh, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he understands it, man. I, I wish we could go to prison, be beaten, even get stoned to death. And still say, yay, glory to God. I'm, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. We can be encouraged when, you know, we lose our job. Like God's just going to let us starve and die. You know, we, 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 don't, we don't realize what these people went through for their faith. And not just that they went through it, but that they went through it still glorifying God. Mm-hmm. They went through it singing hymns as the lions lions are eating them. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to look at those uh, 13 and 14 uh, in the Amplify. It says, um, So I ask you not to lose heart at my sufferings on your behalf, for they are your glory and honor. For this reason, that is, grasping the greatness of this plan by which Jews and Gentiles are joined together in Christ, I bow my knees in reverence before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, well, he's you know, repeating numerous times that this, this cause, this purpose, this mystery, this, it's, all, it's all about the idea that the Jews and the Gentiles are, the salvation is for both parties, not just not just Jews or Israel. So that's that point is being made and repeated over and over again. Um, let me see. Okay, I guess we only have a few minutes left, so let's stop there. Uh, let me see. Where did we end up? This thing? Yeah, so we'll begin with verse 15 next time, Ben, okay? Yep, got it, thanks. Uh, okay, so let's... Uh, Let's take a, a couple minutes now and give our summary remarks here. All right, uh, Brother Ben, why don't you go first? Uh, well, it was a real treat again, once again, to uh, study the word with you guys. You guys got gave me some great insights. 
again adding to my uh, notes um and it was it was good again just to be back with you guys after a couple uh a couple of problems we had last week we, we weren't able to do sunday uh due to tech issues and um i've made a number of uh, took a number of measures to prevent that uh, so that uh, not being able to do this program based on tech issues is, is going to be a uh, far less likely or more a, a more of a rare occasion that we need to cancel. So um, apologies about that, but it's good to be back. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Sister Renee. Yeah. Since I've been gone for about a week, it's, it was great to be refreshed. Uh, this chapter, you know, obviously was talking about the mystery of the Gentiles and the Jews being uh, uh, one body having all the same promises and inheritances. But what I saw here was God's wisdom in revealing things, you know, because we also discussed dispensing and dispensation, God's wisdom and timing in revealing truths and mysteries. Uh, and there's a reason for it. And here we see the reason for it is so that the enemy would not be aware of God's plans and Jesus's full purpose in his coming. And um, we, all, we also see here uh, in, in a couple of verses that we can be bold and come to God in confidence. And, you know, everywhere you look, you, you see that God wanting to have, wanting you to have boldness and confidence and security. It, it's God's will that you be on the right foundation. Nori was talking about that in the chat. You know, if a person thinks they can lose salvation, they're not quite, they're not on the right foundation and you cannot even build on a wrong foundation. It crumbles. And then Ronald posted the verse about whoever hears my sayings and does them is like a wise man who built his house on a rock and you can only build your house on that rock. And then you can do the sayings and the teachings of Jesus. It has to be on him alone. Uh, so this chapter uh, had a lot of hidden wisdom in it. And I really enjoyed going over it. I know we got a little bit more, but thus far. Okay. Thank you, sister. Um, all right. Well, I I've been a little bit distracted in the uh, study of this subject matter because I've been trying to look at the chat room also. It's hard for me to do both of those. Sometimes I, when I watch the program back again uh, and I hear, you know, the comments from, uh, you know, uh, Renee or Ben that uh, I think, wow, that was really great. I, uh, how did I miss that? Well, because I'm trying to do the chat room at the same time. <laughs> But uh, yeah, there's a lot of good um, thoughts and uh, I, things being conveyed in the chat room that uh, I, I am paying attention. And I, I like to also, after it's over, go through the chat room again and more carefully look at the comments. Um, but um, all right, well, we'll pick up here with the next verse uh, next time. This is uh, uh, this is Wednesday, so uh, Renee, do we we have anything a plan for uh, Thursday Throwdown? No, uh, I'm I'm not going to do a weekly thing till I'm I know that the, I'm over the hump safely. Like when it gets cold, I, I start having more pain. My health is a little more shaky, so we'll figure that out. I want to get my health right, uh, but. I will periodically do a live stream. I just won't have a weekly one right now till I figure this stuff out. Okay. Like I want to have Gary Wayne come back again. So it, it uh, he'll probably be one of the first things I do. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, the, the next program we have for you then is uh, Friday, uh, 930 Eastern time on this same channel, a uh, fun fellowship Friday night. So, Thank you, everybody, for participating tonight, and we'll see you all on Friday. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.